Who was Qi Ji Huang? And why does he have a sword named after him? Spoiler, it has to do with pirates. Greetings everyone, welcome to the Sword Lab. We have another review for you, looking at a sword here from LK Chen, the Qi Jia Dao, or the Qi Clan Saber, named after the famous general Qi Ji Guang. Uh, to really understand why we have a saber here called the Qi Jia or the Qi Clan uh, Saber, uh, you really have to know a little bit about the man and the uh, circumstances by which these kind of enter into the landscape, um, as it were. So, a little history on Chi Ji Guang. I've done a blog post that kind of goes a little bit deeper into these topics, so I'll link that here and in the description. Um, Chi Ji Guang was born in Shandong province in 1528 to an illustrious military family. Um, his father, Chi Jin Tong, was an accomplished martial artist and general, and he, at 17 years old, Chi Ji Guang took over the garrison from his father after his death and helped rebuild the navy. He continued this wonderkind performance when he went to Beijing to take the uh, official exams. During that time, Atlan Khan attacked Beijing. This was in 1550. Qi Ji Guang was one of the, one of the testy and applicants, but uh, actually won several awards for valor during the defense of Beijing. In 1553, Qi was then promoted to the Assistant Regional Military Commissioner to Shandong's anti Wokou force. The Wokou, of course, are the Japanese pirates. When Qi Ji Guang took over this particular position, the military situation in the Ming Dynasty, especially on the coast, was pretty dire. The peaceful times that had gone before this, before the Ningbo incident, when the Woku raids really started to become a very, very large problem for the Ming Dynasty, caused a lot of the military facilities to be a burden on the populace. And so they were neglected, run down, um, underfunded, undermanned, all of that. The amount of soldiers on paper was much larger than the reality. And even the soldiers that were there were usually undisciplined, unprincipled, just not very reliable. Also, the supply chain in the Ming Dynasty was such that weapons made for the military were made by local craftsmen near whichever garrison or outpost is being fortified. This created a large variance in the quality of weapons and equipment throughout the military. On the other hand, the Wokou were extremely well armed and well organized. Now, a lot of talk has been made of that the majority of these Japanese pirates as the Woku translates to, were actually local Chinese. Mm. And this is true. That being said, Japanese were a presence in China with these forces. And oftentimes, they were battle-hardened samurai from rather high station, as we can see from um, certain scrolls showing up. Even Shi Ji Wang put out the Kage Ryu school, scroll in his book, the Ji Jia Shen Shu. And the, the armor and the weapons and the equipment that the Japanese were using was far superior in construction and effectiveness than what the Ming army was generally using at the time. Also in the myths, the Portuguese had in created a huge influx of firearms. Um, even though firearms were not used in the coastal conflicts or the raids that much, 
They were used some, but the Woko pretty much relied on arrows and other cold weapons like um, swords, spears, shields, and that kind of thing. So, when Xi Jiguang took over, he had all of these problems to deal with. When he went up against the Japanese, he took note of how they fought, of how they won the battles, of what the different uh, strategies and tactics that, that they were using, and which ones were effective and not. And he was trying to incorporate those into his own fighting force. So the men that he trained in this conflict would use his methods like squad warfare, hence the, the mandarin duck formation, and shields, swords, and this kind of thing. Most of, even though we call the Woko Japanese pirates, most of these conflicts happened on land, inland, and on foot. So these are infantry battles a lot of the time. Looking at the Japanese tactics, he also looked at the Japanese weapons and the equipment. And the Japanese sword, which had already been infused into the Ming Dynasty at the time, which was very popular among collectors, provided a very good template for him to create a sem some semblance of a standardization within his forces. So he very, very much liked the Japanese swords. Specifically, he liked kind of two kinds that he incorporated into a system. The Changdao, which was the long saber, two-handed saber, and the Yaodao, which was the shorter, one-handed saber that is slung from the waist and used as a sidearm. The Yaodao is the sword that now bears Qi Ji Guang's name as the Qi Jia Yaodao. And there really isn't a difference between Wo Yao Dao, which we did a review here, and the Qi Yao Dao. The names are pretty interchangeable. It was named that by later collectors, though, kind of in tribute to Qi Ji Guang. Now, the Waste Sword, or the Yao Dao, according to Qi Ji Guang, was useless without the shield. So, any of the techniques that were used with that saber are often included in shield. So. Um, the part in Ji Jia Shin Shu when he talks about the waist saber, you're actually learning how to use the shield. And the shield being the important um, companion to the one-handed saber to block long weapons, be able to get in close to where they can't get you. And then also working within squad warfare. So during his time on the coast, he formulated these training regimens, these encampments, these tactics, maneuvers, all of these things for the training and organization of troops. He then went to and, and wrote the Ji Jiao Xin Shu. He then was called to uh, back to Beijing, trained the palace guard, and he basically spent the last part of his career on the northern border defending against the Mongols and the other steppe people up there. He also helped fortify the Great Wall. So he wrote his second book, the Langbing Shiji, in 1572. In these two books, pretty much his whole method and ideas surrounding the use of these weapons and these tactics were set down. Unfortunately, as happens with most of these uh, famous generals and heroes of China, he was the victim of politics at the end of his life. His allies in the government had either died or had been disgraced themselves. And so he was re relieved of his command. His wife left him and he basically spent the last years of his life in ailing health and uh, poverty. His methods were never really adopted by the wider Ming military because just the way things were set up, most of that training was taken over by the individual commanders. However, Qi Ji Guang's writings survive to this day, mostly because the writings after the Ming Dynasty fell started to show up in Japan, in Korea, and all throughout Asia in other military um, forces. So these tactics were being used and studied by the military minds of Asia, and even in the later Ming Dynasty, whereas Mao Yunyi put a, 
a good portion of Qi Ji Guang's writings into his book, the Wu Bei Zhi. Anybody um, taking Chinese martial art owes at least a little bit to Qi Ji Guang's methods and training. What are we sitting around talking Chinese history for when we gotta get up? Okay, so now to the sword itself. Um, this is, of course, based on a historical weapon in L.K. Chen's collection. So it is, I believe, a fairly one-to-one -one replica. Uh, but again, there's probably some variation in that. As I said, it is very similar to the Wo Yao Dao, which is this one here, which we did another review of, which we will link in the description. It, the Qi Yao Dao, or the Qi Jia Dao, is a little bit shorter um, than the the Wo Yao Dao. It has um, a uh, straight handle rather than the curved Mongolian or Steppe People's style handle, and but they both are still in the Feng Shi style. This is a little bit lighter than, than the Wo Yao Dao. This comes in at about, or mine comes in sword only weight at about 760 grams. So it's a very nice, light, responsive, quick uh, saber. I really, really like it. I have practiced with it quite a lot. It has iron fittings. This has a kind of grayish paint job. I like the paint job on the Wo Yao Dao a little bit better. It's a it's a little bit better metallic gray, um, but again, none of this. These are just minor nitpicks. The faux leather scabbard here, or it's a wood scabbard with a faux leather covering. Um, it suffers from the same kind of thing that the Wo Yao Dao has, which is it's kind of coming loose here. But other than that, it is a nice solid scabbard. It's got a good tight fit and um, all that. Now, the only one thing here is that the suspension system is not really affixed with glue or anything. It's just kind of free floating. Now, most of the time, it really doesn't matter. Um, the uh, friction itself will hold it there. Anyway, that is that little gripe there. Um, the handle is covered in a leather wrap. The which is nice, and the handle feels very, very nice. Um, it's very comfortable. The problem with the yellow wrap is it does tend to get a little bit dirty, as you can see, kind of like the before and after there. Um, the yellow doesn't hide much of that. Now, the blade itself has that distinctive Japanese curve. Um, it has a fuller. Um, this, again, succeeds in lessening the weight and making this a much lighter, quicker weapon. The pattern weld on my particular example is very, very nice. It's extremely prominent, um, very tight, very orderly, and it gives the blade a really, really nice um, finish. Okay, so sharpness. very sharp and as I've been cutting with it this is one of my favorite cutters um, it has a uh, thinner profile here I'll put all the specs for the dimensions and the uh, steels used and all of that in the description um, as well uh, but so this is a little bit thinner uh, profile or not profile but um, oh yeah profile um, than the Wo Yao Dao. And therefore, it, it really cuts well. It really goes through a target really, really nicely. Um, it has enough of the uh, blade shape and cross section that is made so famous by this style of weapon. Oh. So it's got a very nice keen edge. And again, um, it moves uh, particularly well. 
so in cutting it it really it really performs well I, it's again one of my favorites in doing forms and dali and that kind of thing also one of my favorites um, it has a lanyard i'm getting very nice and used to having lanyards and i'm uh, becoming a little bit wary of using swords that don't have them so um, i am really enjoying the inclusion of the lanyards and everything now the one little little thing that has kind of happened here is the wrap on the handle has come loose here i'm probably gonna have to tuck that back in probably put a little dab of glue on anything something like that so this whole thing doesn't come apart but um that's over a few months of use so um, i would have to say that that this thing really holds up to a lot of abuse a lot of abuse um as i said i've been using it very extensively and the blade is still as good as new so there you go, the Chijia Dao from LK Chen. Go ahead and check it out on their website. We'll have the link in the description. It's probably right underneath me right now as well. It's a great weapon for doing practice with, for doing cutting. If you're looking for an entry level uh, saber for these purposes and you're coming from Wushu or uh, some sort of um, other form of Chinese martial arts um, that uses a Dao, this will be very, Easy, an easy transition for you. Um, it's about the same weight and it'll be, you know, a very good performer. So, so there you go. Um, the Chi Jia Dao by LK Chen. Check it out. We will see you next time. Patience, practice, perseverance.